In this video, I'm going to integrate the VGA interface and put it under program control of the hack computer. Before I do that, though, I wanted to talk with you about what you see here. Let's look at the program ROM. There's really nothing in here other than address translation, so it's pretty straightforward. And if we look at program RAM, same sort of idea, basically just encapsulated load control and address translation just to kind of clean up the main system on chip component. Uh, and of course the hack CPU is the same from those other videos. So in order to integrate the VGA interface, first of all, we need the screen component from our system on chip. Uh, the only thing that uh, is going to be the input is the clock, at least at this point. And then for outputs, obviously we need to plug the monitor in. So we need output pins on the screen. So let's do that. Now let's connect up these signals that can be connected because they don't really require any sort of intermediary logic. And let's talk about these signals for a second. Again, from the CPU's perspective, screen looks like memory. And so to load memory, we've got a load signal. When the CPU wants to write something to memory, it's going to raise load. And when it wants to write something or read something, it's going to present an address. And when it wants to write something from memory, it's going to present the data value at the address through out M. And you can see that these signals are simply being routed directly from the CPU. And if you watch my last video on constructing the screen, you'll remember that the screen component contains the arbitration required uh, to know when to deal with these signals. Now the final signal here is what to do when the screen component wants to uh, write something out on the, on the data bus. So let's just, uh, let's create a signal for that. So what we need to do here is we have a data value coming out from the screen and a data value coming out from program RAM. And both of those values need to be fed into the CPU. And so we need to determine how that's going to happen. And so I propose we just create a memory router that looks at addressing to the CPU and based upon that, feed the correct memory value out for the CPU to consume. So let's create a component to do that. So let's define our IO interface. So this component needs to take a data value from program RAM And it needs to take a data value from video RAM. And it will take the address that was used to yield those two values. And so we need a way to determine what memory does attempt to be accessed via this address. Was it video RAM or was it program RAM? Well, from a prior video, I built a module to, to make that determination. It's called VRAM Access Control. So given an address, it tells you whether that's a VRAM address or not. And now what we need to do is determine which one of these we're going to send to the output. So we need an output first. And 
deciding between two values, let's use a multiplexer. And we already know that these are the two values. So let's just wire those up. Now, it may seem reasonable, I guess, to just wire this up like this. But remember, memory access in Logisim is synchronous always. And so when an address is presented, it's the next clock tick that you get the memory value out. So what we really need is the result of what this address is telling this component, such that that value from the last clock tick is used to determine which of these two data values to actually present through this MUX. So instead of that, let's use a flip-flop. And then we'll need the clock. And there we have a memory router. So back to our system on chip component. Let's insert our new memory router. And now hopefully it becomes clear how we will wire this up. The key here is memory router is feeding the value back into the CPU. So that completes the integration of the screen into the hack computer. So let's test it. So the program I'm going to run to test where we're at is a program called rect.asm. Uh, it's described in chapter six of the elements of computing systems. And I thought I'd just run the program on a simulator so you can see what it's gonna do. So let's just run this, it's gonna be real exciting. As you can see, really exciting. It puts a little rectangle at the upper left corner of the screen. I did make a minor modification to the program that's in the book. And you see these two instructions up here on the top. The original program in the book takes the value from R0. So the number of lines that are in the rectangle is based upon the count that's in R0 that you would load in prior to running this program. I just changed it to hard coded. So I put 16 lines, and then of course moved the value that's in the address register in the D register, and that register is what's used to, to, to load a counter that then counts these lines. So that's the only modification that I made, and I just ran the assembler again to, to produce my binary. So let's load that program into our ROM. So there's our ROM loaded with our program. I think we're ready for synthesis. So I got a synthesis failure and I've encountered this before. If you encounter a similar problem, uh, you can see here, um, I'm getting a naming conflict. RAM contents RAM1 declared uh, basically can't be bound to RAM1 of component. Right? So, so basically there's a some sort of RAM component conflict, and I track this down to uh, actually uh, to be a naming conflict between my two RAM components, which Logisim must not be naming correctly or keeping track of. 
So what I wound up doing, this is the program RAM component. I basically named, I changed the label to be PRAM1. It was normally RAM1. And then back in the screen component, which contains our other RAM, this RAM, I just named it VRAM. So let's try to synthesize this again. Okay, synthesis succeeded. Let's load our design. Okay, here's my monitor. I'm going to hit the program button and let's cross fingers. Monitors come on and there is our rectangle. Success. Okay, so I have a postscript for you. I wish I could say it was that easy, <laughs> but it really was not. And unfortunately, I did not record uh, a chunk of content that uh, I would have found very useful. And that is uh, when I did that the first time, uh, you know, normally, a lot of times when I'm creating this content, I'm doing this stuff off the cuff. I, I um, don't know ahead of time really whether it's going to work or not. However, um, this was a fairly complicated project for me, and uh, I actually had done some work to try to get this to work, and I could not get it to work. You know, I had I, t I typically just let my camera roll and you know go piece back, edit it together to try to make something coherent. Uh, but there was so much content of me struggling through the debug session, trying to figure stuff out, that I just just couldn't edit it together. It was just too, it was too big, but. To be honest, I really owed it to you to show that, you know, it was really not that easy. And there was a bug that was introduced as a result of putting this memory router in. And so I, I owed it to you to show at least where the bug was and some semblance of how I figured it out. So if we look at how it draws the rectangle, it gets the address word that it's going to set, because it's setting all 16 pixels in that word to negative one here, but it has to set the address beginning of the line where it's going to set the pixels, and that is stored in inside RAM. So this instruction sets the address to the pointer of what's stored in RAM, and then that memory location is set to negative one, which is all Fs, which is all, all the bits in that word get turned on. Well, this instruction was not executing correctly. Now, normally that's, that instruction was working fine in my you know, prior videos where I was testing the CPU, that that instruction was working correctly. However, with the introduction of the memory router, it no longer was working correctly. And the reason is because if, if you'll recall, I, I ran into problems with the hack CPU design as it relates to using synchronous RAM as opposed to asynchronous RAM reading memory. And so I had to put this hold off circuitry in here to hold off consuming the value from memory until a clock tick has occurred so that we can read memory. And the deregister and the program counter, I had modified the load control to take that into account. However, I had failed to modify that for the A register and sort of makes sense with the bug now because that instruction was setting the value of the A register from memory. So what I did to correct this problem Is I passed in the read the read memory flag like I'd done on the other components.
and only when read memory is false. Is it okay to do a load? like that. So now you have the correct design that should work. Now, if you're curious as to how I figured that out, I'm willing to create some content to sort of walk through the design. It requires uh, disassembling or matching up the instructions to the machine code and step-by-step -step walking through this to uh, make sure that the instructions are doing exactly what you expect. It's a tedious process. I'm willing to do it. If you'd like to see it, put it in the comments. And if enough people suggest, then I'll go do it. Thanks for watching.